Now let me discuss the other low ceiling diuretics which are called the potassium sparing diuretics. Now this particular potassium sparing diuretics we have two types that is now before that we have a question like potassium sparing diuretics include spironolactone, triamterene, amyloride, ethacrinic acid and then bumetanide. So this is the MCQ. Now once we are discussing or once we are discussed with the potassium sparing diuretic now we will come back to this question once again. Alright. Now you take this potassium sparing diuretics. These potassium sparing diuretics they include they are of two types. One is the sodium channel blockers. One is the sodium channel blockers and the other group of drugs are aldosterone antagonists. Aldosterone antagonists. So these are the two groups of your potassium sparing diuretics. Now if you take the site of action of the potassium sparing diuretics, remember they act in the late distal convoluted tubule and they act in the collecting duct right they act in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct to preserve potassium right to preserve potassium now you see the point here you take the remaining diuretics, you take carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, you take loop diuretics, you take thiazide diuretics, they cause potassium loss, they will cause hypokalemia. Whereas you take your potassium sparing diuretics, they will preserve the potassium, right? They will preserve the potassium. Now, now before going into the mechanism of action of these particular cells, let me tell you what exactly is the physiology which is happening at the level of the late distal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct. Now within the collecting duct we have a type of cells which are called as the principal cells. Right which are called as principal cells. Now the luminal portion right luminal portion of this particular renal tubule contains what is called as epithelial sodium channels right the luminal portions of this particular principal cells they contain what is called epithelial sodium channels this epithelial sodium channels they are responsible for the reabsorption of sodium so once this particular sodium is reabsorbed through this particular epithelial channels which are present within the luminal surface of the cell the lumen will turn into the negativity so the positivity is being reabsorbed into the cell. So due to decreased positive charge in the lumen, there will be a trans epithelial potential difference that is being generated. That means the positive charge is being reabsorbed. So there will be a trans epithelial, trans epithelial potential difference is generated. That means the lumen will turn into negative whereas the principal cell will turn into what is called positive. Now under this potential gradient right under this potential gradient remember now this particular negativity whichever is being developed within the lumen should be neutralized in a normal individual. So this particular negativity for neutralizing this negativity the potassium is secreted from the principal cells and as well as the H plus ions is secreted from the intercalated cells right under this potential gradient to neutralize the negativity whichever has been developed the potassium is secreted and as well as the H plus ion is being secreted into the luminal cell and they will neutralize the negativity. Now the secretion of potassium and the secretion of the H plus into the lumen 
it is being promoted by what is called aldosterone it is promoted by what is called aldosterone now you take this aldosterone let me discuss what exactly the aldosterone does now all of your cells the remaining diuretics if you take you take the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors you take thiazide diuretics you take loop diuretics they will act on the nephron from the luminal side they will act on the nephron from the luminal side whereas you take this particular aldosterone antagonist they act or they show their diuretic effect not from the luminal surface they show their effect from the other part of the cell they show their effect from the other part of the cell now you take this aldosterone what it will do is aldosterone it will come and bind with the aldosterone receptor which is present within the cell now once the aldosterone is bound to this particular receptor which is present in the cell this will this receptor it which is bound to the aldosterone it will activate the nucleus this nucleus in response to that it will produce what is called aldosterone induced protein right it will produce a protein called aldosterone induced protein now what does this aldosterone induced protein will do aldosterone induced protein will try to activate this particular sodium channels right aldosterone induced protein will activate the sodium epithelial channels so once this particular sodium epithelial channels are activated the sodium is being reabsorbed right the sodium is being reabsorbed now once the sodium is being reabsorbed there is development of negativity in order to neutralize this negativity the potassium is being secreted and h plus ion is being secreted that is what exactly the aldosterone will do right this is what exactly the aldosterone will do now now we will see this is the normal physiology what is happening within the principal cells and as well as the intercalated cells now we will see how this particular potassium sparing diuretics will cause inhibition of the sodium reabsorption first we have a group of drugs that is your epithelial right epithelial sodium channel inhibitors now what does this epithelial sodium channel inhibitors do these drugs remember they are basic in nature right they are basic in nature and they reach the lumen of the proximal tubule by secretion remember this epithelial sodium channel inhibitors they will enter where they will enter at the level of the proximal convoluted tubule but how are they entering into the proximal convoluted tubule by the process of what is called secretion right by the process of secretion these particular sodium channel inhibitor epithelial sodium channel inhibitors they are secreted into the proximal convoluted tubule right through right secretion of these substances is through what is called organic base secretory system organic base secretory system right through organic base secretory system this epithelial sodium channel inhibitors they get secreted into the lumen of your proximal tubule now now in the lumen it will travel right by traveling through the lumen these drugs they reach its site of action at the level of late distal tubules and as well as the collecting duct right by traveling through the lumen they reach the site of the distal tubules and as well as the collecting duct now what are the important members of these particular drugs remember the important members of these particular drugs they include your amyloride right and as well as triamterene
right where are they entering they are entering at the level of the proximal tubule how are they entering by the process of what is called secretion right by through which process through organic based secretory system and by passing the, through the lumen by traveling the entire lumen they will reach their site of action next now once they reach their site what do what do they do they will block this sodium epithelial channels right they will block this sodium epithelial channels so once they block this sodium epithelial channels the sodium is not reabsorbed the sodium is not reabsorbed now once the sodium is not reabsorbed the sodium it starts secreting or it starts excreting within the urine but remember what did we discuss the amount of sodium reabsorption at the level of the collecting duct or collecting tubules the amount of sodium which is reabsorbed at the level of the collecting duct is only 3% so when your epithelial sodium channel inhibitors are acting it will inhibit only 3% of reabsorption of sodium that means only 3% of sodium will start excreting within the urine and along with sodium water is also being dragged out so the amount of sodium which is being lost is minimal the amount of water which is being lost is also minimal so that is the reason why these particular epithelial sodium channel inhibitors or your potassium sparing diuretics they are low ceiling diuretics they are low ceiling diuretics so this is the mechanism of action of these particular epithelial sodium channel inhibitors now now remember we have two drugs one is amyloride and as well as triamterene right triamterene among these two drugs amyloride is more potent and longer acting than triamterene this is a very very important point right among these two drugs amyloride is more potent and longer acting than triamterene whereas you take this triamterene triamterene is less often used of its incomplete absorption we don't use triamterene much why because triamterene it has incomplete absorption and not only that this triamterene it will cause impairment of your glucose metabolism there is impairment of glucose tolerance and not only that this triamterene it is associated with the photosensitivity so because of this triamterene is not often used number 1 it has incomplete absorption number 2 it will cause photosensitivity number 3 what this triamterene will do is this triamterene is less often used why because it has incomplete absorption number 2 it has it is associated with the photosensitivity and number 3 there is impairment of glucose tolerance with this triamterene that is the reason why it is less often used and the other point is this triamterene it is also associated with interstitial nephritis and renal stone formation right it is also associated with interstitial nephritis and as well as renal stone formation and remember as such your triamterene right as such your triamterene it is a weak folic acid antagonist right it is a weak folic acid antagonist now because it is a weak folic acid antagonist and folic acid it is required for the erythropoiesis so once there is folic acid deficiency the individual will land up in what is called as megaloblastic anemia right the individual will land up in what is called megaloblastic anemia especially in cirrhotic persons right especially in cirrhotic persons triamterene it is associated with the megaloblastic anemia now so summarizing the points about the triamterene we use this less often why because it is having inadequate absorption 
it is associated with photosensitivity it will cause impairment of glucose metabolism and it is associated with interstitial nephritis and renal stone formation and it is a weak folic acid antagonist and that is the reason why it will cause megaloblastic anemia whereas you take your amyloride now what did we discuss about the amyloride amyloride it is more potent compared to that of your triamterin and amyloride it is also associated with certain adverse effects what are those amyloride it decreases the magnesium and calcium excretion right amyloride it decreases calcium and magnesium excretion that is the first point and it also increases the urate excretion right amyloride it also increases the urate excretion and it decreases the calcium and magnesium excretion now we have a substance called as lithium right we have a substance called lithium this particular lithium it is reabsorbed right it is being reabsorbed through epithelial sodium channels in the collecting ducts and at toxic doses can cause diabetes insipidus remember lithium is a substance which will cause what is called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and this lithium it is being reabsorbed right it is being reabsorbed through your epithelial sodium channels now what is your amyloride doing amyloride it is inhibiting the sodium channels so when amyloride is inhibiting the sodium channels do you think that the lithium will be reabsorbed no lithium is not reabsorbed so amyloride is the drug of choice for lithium induced diabetes insipidus this is a very very important point amyloride is a drug of choice for lithium induced diabetes insipidus how do they act it acts by blocking the entry of this lithium through this particular channels all right next the another use of amyloride number 1 amyloride is a potassium sparing diuretic that is the first use and apart from that amyloride is also useful for lithium induced diabetes insipidus and the other point is amyloride can also be used as an aerosol to decrease the secretions in cystic fibrosis patients right okay in cystic fibrosis patients we get copious amount of secretions and that to thick secretions so when you take this amyloride in the form of aerosol this amyloride will decrease the secretion in patients with the cystic fibrosis right so let me revise about this particular amyloride amyloride as such it's a potassium sparing diuretic and it is an epithelial sodium channel inhibitor that means it will inhibit the epithelial sodium channel which is present in the principal cells of your collecting duct and thereby the sodium reabsorption does not take place the sodium it starts excreting in the urine only 3% of sodium so it will cause minimal diuresis so it is called low ceiling diuretic and amyloride it is more potent compared to that of triamterin and it decreases the calcium and magnesium excretion and it increases the urate excretion and amyloride the other use of amyloride is it is used in lithium induced diabetes insipidus and how is it used in lithium induced diabetes insipidus normally whenever an individual take lithium lithium it is absorbed through your epithelial sodium channels and that will cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus now what is your amyloride doing amyloride is blocking the entry of the lithium through the sodium channels and that is the reason why it is used in case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus whereas amyloride is also useful in cystic fibrosis patients whenever you give this amyloride in the form of aerosol that will decrease the secretion in patients with the cystic fibrosis